everyone, it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Mark Gluck, um, uh, today's speaker for, for Grand Rounds. Um, he's a professor of the Center for Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience at Rutgers University, New York, and he's the co-director of the Rutgers Memory Disorder Project. Um, he did his undergrad at Harvard and his PhD at Stanford on cognitive uh, psychology, and he's been at Rutgers since 1991. He's had a number of investigator and career awards and uh, over 100 journal publications. So currently his lab is focusing on animal and human learning and brain and behavior. And um, amongst some of the participants that he's been studying, um, there are uh, pa patients with normal aging, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So um, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Glick on a recent event, Understanding Current Trends in Research and Clinical Care for Parkinson's Disease last week. Um, and Dr. Glick's talk today is about the cognitive and clinical neuroscience of reward-based feedback learning in the stride. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be back here. And I want to talk today um, about one particular behavioral task um, that was developed in collaboration with uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Catherine Myers, who's uh, in the neuroscience and neurology department, but was formerly a, a postdoc and a research professor. Uh, over at Rutgers Newark and CMBN. And it, we, it's a task that we use to look at reward-based feedback learning in the striatum. So today I'm going to be seven parts to the talk, uh, talk a little bit about the background of feedback learning, uh, describe this behavioral paradigm that Catherine and I had developed, then look at a variety of data that we've used to understand uh, the neural substrates of this kind of co cognitive function, brain imaging, genetics. I'll focus primarily on Parkinson's disease because I know this is a neurology group end by talking a little bit about two other disorders, a major depressive disorder and PTSD, and use them to make reference back to how it could inform some of our understanding of what's happening in Parkinson's disease. So we'll start by going way back to ancient Greece um, and the question that Aristotle posed, how do we come to associate two things in our mind? And this was the fundamental question in philosophy, which led to the psychology of learning. How do these associations come about? And the learning that we talk about is the process by which changes in behavior are a result, as the re result as of experience with the world. And for example, if Aristotle had uh, tried this uh, broccoli um, and uh, maybe he didn't like it, he made him sick, uh, he learned an association between broccoli and an aversive response. And so we're interested in how these associations are formed behaviorally as well as biologically. And uh, Aristotle developed three rules of association which describe still the basics of how we understand these associations are formed. The first is contiguity. Experiences near each other in time or space are associated. Frequency. Experiences often repeated are associated more strongly. And lastly, similarity. Experiences which are similar to one another are associated. And I'm going to focus here mostly on these two, the fact that things that occur close together frequently become associated, and that's the basis of modern theories of learning and psychology. And in particular, a theory proposed by uh, Edward Thorndike, called, which we call the law of effect, and it's very simple, it's almost intuitively obvious in retrospect, that behaviors with positive outcomes, what we call reward, are increased, their, their probability is increased, their frequency, their intensity is increased, um, and behaviors with negative outcomes are punished, or, or those that, ex that have punishment following them, are decreased, the likelihood of them happening. And if you see this sort of, uh, one can think of this from, from and, the, and the way Thorndike thought of it, it was like Darwin's natural selection um, being applied not at the level of species, but at the level of individual behaviors. Behaviors will survive if they're adaptive and they become, they increase in their propensity to, to survive and be repeated. They tend to die out if they're followed by uh, negative consequences. In essence, it's talking about learning by carrot or by stick. We can learn to, we can train a donkey or a child or, or an adult to either with a reward, to a, a carrot to approach a reward, or we can teach them to uh, avoid uh, a punishment. And the way that we've developed this task, Catherine Myers, um, is as follows. So we train people on a probabilistic category learning. And by probabilistic category learning, I mean that every cue, every pattern, is associated with multiple categories, in this case two, um, but the mapping is probabilistic. There's not a simple rule. Things tend to, go, you know, a certain pattern will tend to go with one outcome rather than the other with a probability of 80% or 85 or 90%, but not be perfect. 
And we train people not by telling them these associations, but by their experiencing them. So they'll see a particular pattern, and they'll be asked to make a prediction. They make a choice. To predict, they might choose A. And sometimes they'll get positive feedback. And positive feedback is a smiley face. It's, it's, it's affective feedback. It's also we give them reward points. Um, and uh, since many of these students are probably pre-med, when we do it in undergraduates, they're all motivated to get into med school. They think every grade counts for medical school. So they're motivated if we tell them that. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll look at a pattern and they'll, class, they'll make a response B and they'll get negative feedback. Negative feedback is given to them in the, in the form of a, uh, an unhappy face, a red smiley face, and they'll lose points. They'll be less likely to get into medical school. Um, and sometimes we don't tell them at all what the outcome is. Um, we just we let them guess and they get no feedback at all. So the way in this is structured, that, that's what the trials look like to the people. Um, they can then be trained with reward. So there's a cue, and they'll get either positive feedback, um, or if they get it right, and there'll be no feedback if they get it wrong. Um, they'll be trained with punishment. So they'll get no feedback if it's correct, but they'll get negative feedback if they're uh, wrong. And so you'll see here that the, that the absence of feedback, the no feedback trials, are ambiguous across the, tri the experiment, because sometimes they occur when they get it wrong, and sometimes when people get it right. And so the effect of this is that it allows us to look at different cues that are being trained and uh, have some of them trained by the carrot and some trained by the stick. And then we look at their learning curves for the different cues separately. And we can measure then the degree to which people are more sensitive or more biased to learning to approach reward or to avoid punishment. So where does this kind of learning occur in the brain? Well, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that it occurs in the basal ganglia and in the, particularly in the dorsal striatum. So the dorsal striatum has long been known to be critically involved in stimulus response feedback learning. Um, and, that, and some of the evidence comes from some studies that we did um, a number of years ago in brain imaging, where we looked at which brain regions tend to differentiate between uh, positive and feedback. Um, and what we found was that in the left caudate, um, in the dorsal striatum, was associated with coding differences for positive feedback. And the ventral striatum um, in the right nucleus accumbens for negative feedback was sort of the brain region where you saw the most differential responding. So to summarize that imaging study, um, the dorsal striatum, the left caudate, is associated with positive feedback. The ventral striatum, the right nucleus accumbens, with negative feedback. And we'll come back to this, this mapping. We're seeing a mapping here that's both hemispheric laterality, left, right, but also dorsal ventral. And we'll see that pattern coming up in a number of different ways. So the question we ask is, are there individual differences across people in the degree to which uh, there is this lateralization left reward that we found as a group effect in the imaging study? And do these variations relate to natural variations in the laterality of these dopamine bind receptors? And this led us to a study we did uh, uh, a number of years ago where we used uh, dopamine D2 receptor binding. Um, and we looked at the laterality of the receptor binding in individuals as correlated with their sensitivity to reward or punishment. And I won't go through the details of the study, but the bottom line is that there's a left striatal basis for processing reward. So the more uh, striatal receptors that you, tend, that you have on the left, the more likely people are to be biased to learn faster on the reward train cues than the punishment train cues. So consistent with the, with the fMRI data before. So a schematic that sort of is emerging from both of these imaging studies using different techniques um, is that the positive feedback rewards associated with the left dorsal area and the negative feedback or punishment associated with the right ventral. So another way we can look at some of these dissociations is looking at behavioral genetics, and particularly looking at both dopamine and serotonin genes. Um, these are naturally occurring variations in, in key neuromodulators that affect feedback learning. Uh, one gene that we look at is the DAT1, the dopamine transporter gene, which modulates dopamine availability, especially in the dorsal striatum, and has been implicated in the past in positive or feedback learning. And a serotonin transporter gene, which modulates serotonin availability throughout the striatum as well as other brain regions. So the dopamine transporter gene has two variations, a nine repeat, which results in high dopamine, and a 10 repeat, which results in lower levels of dopamine in the synapse. So what we see um, 
in studies across uh, a significant number of subjects, we're looking here, you know, 80, 70 to 80 in, in these groups, um, is that the nine repeat carriers, so the lower number means that there's a higher uh, dopamine availability, they learn better from positive feedback, but there's no effect of this DAT1 on negative feedback. And these are all in healthy subjects. Um, these are also, I should point out, um, also uh, racially uh, homogenous subjects. These are all subjects who were studied um, from the southern regions of the Palestinian West Bank, um, which is a very racially uh, homogenous area where people marry a lot within there. So there's much less variability here in this population than you would find if you did it in the very diverse areas of Newark. Um, the other gene, uh, serotonin transporter gene, again, there is a, a high serotonin variation, an SS, and a L, a low serotonin variation. And here we find, again, in the same Palestin homogenous Palestinian population, um, what we see is that overall high serotonin learns less from both positive and negative feedback. So the summary is that high dopamine, um, as seen in, in individuals, improves positive feedback learning, but high serotonin impairs both types of learning. So now let me get to sort of the focus of, of people's interest here, which is Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to talk about a number of different threads to our Parkinson's work. Um, and uh, this is sort of the basis for, for what we're hoping to build up a larger Parkinson's research program here at Rutgers uh, with Tasneem and with Tony looking at both uh, patients and in, uh, with DBS, as well as studies that we're beginning uh, with the neurology and neurosurgery group down in New Brunswick with Dan Schneider and, and others. So uh, let me just go back here. This is an audience that doesn't need a summary of dopamine and Parkinson's disease, um, but Parkinson's, of course, uh, a particularly uh, advantageous way to look at the effect of the dopamine modulation on, in the striatum. And the question we've asked is how is the first, the most basic question is how is feedback learning uh, affected in Parkinson's disease? And one of the challenges here is to differentiate the effect of the dopamine medication from the effect of Parkinson's disease itself. Now, going back to this imaging slide, you'll note that if we're looking at uh, early, Park you know, mild to moderate Parkinson's patients, then most of their uh, uh, dysfunction will be in the dorsal striatum, the areas that we've seen uh, necessary for positive feedback, um, and, uh, but not so much damage in the uh, uh, ventral striatum. So how is feedback learning affected in Parkinson's disease? And our prediction then is that de novo patients with dorsal striatal dysfunction should be impaired at reward learning, but medicated patients, and there's a suggestion that, if, that when you medicate patients with uh, uh, dopamine agonists, you're going to overdose regions that are not otherwise normal, which would be the ventral striatum. And therefore, if the ventral striatum is responsible more for these punishment pathways, then putting them on medication may overdose those brain regions. Um, so the question is, we have to find, to do this kind of study, um, we have to find patients who have never been medicated, de novo patients. And uh, one place in which we found them is in Hungary and uh, working with a, a clutch clinic there. And what we see here, this shows the learning curve for positive feedback and negative feedback. And what we see is that de novo Parkinson's patients are impaired at learning from positive feedback. So the, the PD de novo, the DN is de novo, show a very strong deficit on positive feedback um, while there's no significant effect on the negative feedback. When we put them then, or they're, then they're put on dopamine agonists, in this case they're on, only on dopamine agonists, uh, you see two things happen. One is that it remediates the reward learning deficit, uh, so they're fine there, but it introduces a new deficit, which is that uh, you see a deficit in negative feedback learning, in learning from punishing feedback that was never present in the de novo patients, one interpretation being that these medications are overdosing these ventral circuits and therefore disrupting negative feedback. Uh, we had a little bit of pilot data um, suggesting that some of the patients who showed on medication the most, the most uh, improvement in learning from reward, the strongest learning from reward on medication, were those who down the road were the most likely to develop impulse control disorders. And so the idea being that one of the reasons why dopamine agonists may be causing impulse control disorders is that in a subset of the population, they seem to show uh, an exaggerated reward respo re response to reward on the medications. Um, I'm going to skip over, this is just some of the new, we have some data in Italy, I'm going to skip over that. Um, 
a particular interest now that, that the sort of the trends in treatment have shifted from treating with dopamine agonists to less treatment with dopamine agonists um, and more treating with levodopa, there's a lot of interest in understanding how do these two, how do these two medications differentially affect cognition. Um, the, uh, they obviously have different mechanisms of action in the brain. And uh, again, we, uh, a lot of our work, you know, we're, trying to, we're interested in working here locally, but we also do a lot of work uh, globally. I mentioned the Hungarian work. We've got the work in the Palestinian territories. In each case, we're sort of interested in leveraging some of the uh, uh, unique circumstances of the population. Um, and one of the things that China has um, is large N, um, as well as racial homogeneity. Um, and so we've been doing, we've been developing a, a Parkinson's program there. Um, and uh, so this is some data from Shanghai, some pilot data from Shanghai, where we're looking at patients who are on levodopa, de, de novo, or dopamine agonist. And it's still sort of work in progress. Um, but the main finding is that the, uh, the patients on levodopa have both higher reward and uh, higher punishment learning. So that those on levodopa are being, at least here, significantly improved at their reward learning. We're not seeing much of an effect of dopamine agonist, so that's not replicating the Hungarian data, at least in this small n so far, but a very strong effect from the levodopa, even stronger, improving reward learning. Uh, but the most interesting finding here that does replicate the Hungarian is that the dopamine agonists are impairing punishment learning, but the levodopa is not. And that is consistent with the idea that you would see, for example, much less likelihood of impulse control disorders in patients on levodopa. And we see that mirrored in the cognitive results here that the levodopa um, is not impairing their ability to be sensitive to the negative consequences of their actions. Um, so going back to the issue of uh, sort of de novo, even before de novo patients would be prodromal patients, people who are going to get Parkinson's in a number of years. And uh, there's evidence suggesting people always, of course, think about Parkinson's as a movement disorder. It, it, it's, it's treated in movement disorder clinics. But a growing literature suggesting that it's much more than movement disorder. And in fact, these non-movement aspects of Parkinson's may well appear earlier than the movement disorders. Um, and that's hard to study because it's hard to find people and study people before they get Parkinson's. So again, this brings us to the challenge of how do we find people um, who we know or we think are going to get Parkinson's in the next few years. And again, this brings us back to Hungary, to a very rural area um, called the Buzsák region. And you see it in the lower right. And when you live in, in this little village of Buzsák, um, when it comes time to get married, you basically have your cousin on this side of the road or your cousin on that side of the road. There's not a lot of options. Um, as a result, you get uh, a lot of in inbreeding, and there's a particular rare duplication of the alpha-synuclein gene um, that's seen in this family here, in this region here. Those who get to have this gene have an almost certain to get Parkinson's. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to show the data, but these people we tested, they were all healthy normals. Um, some were on the med, some, some had this, this variation, others didn't. Two years later, they all had Parkinson's disease. Um, and we saw the same reward learning deficit in the gene carriers, but not in the non-gene carriers, suggesting that this, source, this reward learning cognitive deficit, at least in this particular form of Parkinson's, precedes by two years uh, the, the, the emergence of the motor symptoms. Um, so a little bit of a summary here. Uh, the de novo and prodromal patients are impaired at feedback learning. Uh, dopamine agonists seem to improve the uh, reward learning, at least in some of the studies. Uh, very consistently, the, the dopamine agonists are impairing the punishment learning. Um, and so the result being that Parkinson's patients on dopamine agonists seem to have a very impaired learning from negative feedback. And so again, if we sort of think of that back in the, as a, uh, the context of these impulse control disorders, you know, going gambling uh, makes a lot of sense if all you remember are the three or four times you won mon money and the hundred times that you put money in and lost it, you're just not processing away. So one can think about these impulse control disorders as being a failure to appropriately encode the negative consequences of your actions when they occur. So let me get back to this issue of laterality. I started out by talking about uh, uh, the left versus right dissociation in the brain imaging studies for reward and punishment pathways. Um, Given this left dorsal is for reward, right ventral for punishment, what are the implications for Parkinson's disease? Um, as most of you know, Parkinson's patients, most of them will tend to show a, a laterality of onset, um, which is mirrored ipsilaterally with the laterality, uh, of, of contralaterally with the laterality of the uh, um, uh, damage in the dorsal striatum. 
So I'm going to refer here for simplicity to less left hemisphere Parkinson's patients, those are those who have right onset symptoms, and right hemisphere Parkinson's patients, those who have left onset symptoms, just so we don't have too many flippings going on in our brains. So this is the ski back again of, of what we think the, some of the, the functional pathways are in the striatum. Um, so our prediction is that de novo patients should be more impaired, the left hemisphere de novo patients should be more impaired at positive feedback learning because that's where most of these positive feedback pathways are. The complicated story then is uh, what happens when you medicate them. So we would imagine that when they're medicated, they should be fine in terms of the reward learning, but more likely to overdose these brain regions, including the negative feedback areas. So we would expect that the left hemisphere patients who are medicated, um, and I, I mentioned just the medicated predictions because that's the data that we have now, they should be fine at reward but impaired at punishment because of the overdosing. In contrast, this is, you have to keep, keep flipping, the story keeps flipping every time you add some, a, a variable here. So the right hemisphere de novo patients should be less impaired at positive feedback learning because their, their impairments are mostly in the regions that are not so responsible for positive feedback, but not so clear what we would predict with, when they're medicated. It's a little bit more complicated here. So overall prediction uh, is shown here in a schematic that we expect that left hemisphere Parkinson's patients should do better at reward learning, these are all medicated, than the right hemisphere. Uh, we expect that left hemisphere medicated patients should be impaired at punishment. It's not clear what the prediction should be for the right hemisphere. Um, and this is data from Italy, again, a relatively homogeneous region uh, racially. And uh, what we see here, um, again, this is pilot data. We've got about 15 subjects. Uh, we see exactly what we had expected in terms of the reward, that those patients who have left hemisphere Parkinson's do much better at, at, at reward learning um, as opposed to the right hemisphere patients. We see what we expected was that the left hemisphere patients um, show a significantly uh, worse learning from punishment. So it suggests that not only can, does medication have an effect on whether or not you're biased for learning from reward or punishment, but also the laterality of the symptoms. So I'm going to talk about now two other uh, psychiatric disorders um, and then relate some of the findings we have there back to uh, Parkinson's. So major depressive disorder affects almost 20% of adults. One in 10 Americans uh, take antidepressants. And uh, there's a lot of evidence for basal ganglia dysfunction in major depressive disorder. Um, anhedonia has been associated with dopaminergic dysfunction, antidepressants. Um, even those that are called selective serotonin antidepressants, uh, enhanced dopamine. Pa people with depression have a three times risk of, uh, three times increased risk for developing Parkinson's, and about half of all Parkinson's patients have comorbid depression. So very relevant to, to Parkinson's. So based on our earlier Parkinson studies and these DAT1 studies, we would expect that MDD patients um, should have depleted dopamine uh, function in the striatum and therefore have impaired reward learning, impaired learning from positive feedback. Um, and this shows exactly that. And this is overlaying our depression results in blue with our previous Parkinson's results. Um, and these are both de novo Parkinson's compared to de novo uh, depressed. And you see the same pattern, that positive feedback is impaired in both, but negative feedback learning is not. Um, let me turn now to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, it's a severe anxiety disorder that develops after exposure to psychological trauma, symptoms of re-experiencing, avoidance, emotional numbing, hyperarousal, um, and it has to happen for at least a month and cause significant impairment in life functioning. Traditional view of PTSD is to think of it in the context of being an anxiety disorder, um, and, and in particular focusing on frontal lobe and amygdala dysfunction. Um, in work, again, with Catherine Myers, um, we've argued for a different perspective on PTSD, that one can think of it also as a learning disorder. And actually, forget the hippocampus here, because I'm not going to talk about the hippocampal side of the story. Um, and the, uh, that's the two-hour version of the talk. You have to come back next week for it. Uh, so there's a lot of data suggesting that uh, PTSD is associated with reward deficiency, uh, high rates of substance abuse in PTSD, uh, high rates of emotional numbing and anhedonia, one of the, the symptoms that's been associated in the depression literature with uh, 
uh, dopaminergic function. Experimentally, there's evidence of striatal dopaminergic hypoactivity. I'll show some data in a minute, as well as decreased reward seeking in people with PTSD. So a number of reasons why one might expect dopaminergic dysfunction in PTSD. Uh, this is some data from uh, 2009 from another group showing uh, uh, that there is, uh, in PTSD patients, uh, depressed uh, striatal activity in these patients. Okay, so the question then is, how does Parkinson's impact learning from positive feedback, positive feedback or reward and punishment using the same task? Um, well, this, in this particular group, we see healthy subjects learn quite well. Um, and uh, in contrast, PTSD patients are impaired at positive feedback learning, impaired at this sort of reward learning. So just like we've seen in depression and in Parkinson's. Now, because there's so much comorbidity of PTSD and depression, one possible explanation for this might be that perhaps what we're seeing here is just the effect of the comorbid depression. But if we separate out the non-depressed PTSD from those with depression, we see they both show this, this reward learning deficit. So it isn't simply explained by being a consequence of the depression. Um, so in summary, um, PTSD patients who are depressed and non-depressed show a deficit in this reward learning. Um, we've begun doing some pilot data on using resting state brain connectivity. This is work that we're doing at NYU as part of the uh, NYU Army Biomarkers PTSD program. And uh, we've been collecting a lot of this functional connectivity data and analyzing it both at the group level and now beginning to analyze it at the individual subject level to correlate it with cognition. So I want to describe just a little bit of the pilot data um, between these groups that we've been studying. And um, this is a complicated graph, um, but basically what it's showing is the main regions um, of the basal ganglia, uh, the caudate nu nucleus, the putamen, the nucleus accumbens, and it's showing connectivity between each of these regions, both within a hemisphere and across the hemisphere. And what we find is that in PTSD, it's kind of hard to see this here, we find in the PTSD, there is an enhanced connectivity between the hemispheres. Um, so that the patients with PTSD, the ones who show these reward learning deficits, are seeing in, in enhanced connectivity, um, and that's just some of the p-values, uh, between the hemispheres. And the reason that's um, of interest is that we know from the, uh, the deep brain stimulation literature that one of the uh, hypotheses for the efficacy of deep brain stimulation is that Parkinson's patients have too much uh, redundant firing in their basal ganglia, and the DBS is sort of breaking that so that, the, so that the firing of the individual neurons can continue to be informative. So what we're seeing here then is that in these PTSD patients who uh, show these reward learning deficits, we're seeing redundancy across the hemispheres, excessive, excessive uh, functional connectivity. Um, and so we think, you know, our hypothesis is that this may be conceptually related to the, to the reason why uh, deep brain stimulation may be effective in improving reward learning if it's breaking this connectivity um, by breaking this sort of the synchrony. So that's all sort of a hypothesis, but it's a way in which this, this connectivity data in PTSD may sort of shed light on some of the issues that we might want to look at in terms of deep brain stimulation. Um, so for example, it's because this sort of leading into sort of discussions about collaboration, one of the things we'd love to do is sort of replicate these analyses before and after uh, deep brain stimulation, perhaps um, to the extent that they can be done uh, in patients with implants to look at this kind of connectivity on or off stimulation. And our prediction is that off stimulation, you'll see a similar uh, cross-hemispheric connectivity and on stimulation, you'll see less. Um, and this is just some, some individual subject data uh, showing that, uh, again, it's sort of all sort of low end, but showing some connectivity, that the striatal connectivity in PTSD correlates with reward learning. So that the higher the connectivity, the, the cross hemisphere is the worst they're doing on the learning. So let me just sort of summarize now. Uh, the, uh, so from both fMRI and PET studies suggest that the left dorsal striatum is uh, critical in reward learning and the right ventral striatum in punishment learning. That variations in dopamine transporter gene predict individual differences in reward learning, while serotonin transporter gene mediates overall learning. De novo and prodromal Parkinson's patients are impaired at reward learning. Dopamine agonist medicated patients are impaired at punishment learning. <coughs> 
This may relate to some of the differences in sensitivity to impulse control disorders. L-DOPA, there's less cognitive impairment than dopamine agonists. Um, and the laterality of onset of motor symptoms can predict some important differences between these reward and punishment deficits. And finally, de novo depressed patients show the same reward learning deficit seen in de novo PD. I, I didn't show the SSRI data or the genetics. And PTSD patients show impaired reward learning that is not explained by comorbid depression. And the resting state connectivity suggests that a mechanism for this may be the interhemispheric striatal connectivity um, being excessively above normal. So, um, and that's just sort of a, comes back to this sort of brain schematic. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about future directions, just focusing on the Parkinson's, because part of uh, our discussions with Tasneem and, and, and Tony and others down in New Brunswick is to begin to develop more of a, a, uh, a Parkinson's research program here. Um, so some of the issues that we think are uh, worthy of further discussion, and we've already begun having some of these discussions, comparing on versus withdrawn patients from levodopa, um, and uh, sort of paralleling some of what we've done with dopamine agonists in Hungary, and particularly linking some of this to the uh, psychiatric symptoms, particularly apathy, um, as well as the effects of the, you know, further effects of looking at laterality. Um, in the DBS studies, um, to look at different stimulation sites, um, and as well as different stimulating electrodes and how different patterns of electrodes, um, and eventually moving to doing recording in the operating room during surgery. Um, using event-related fMRI with Parkinson's patients, and Tasneem and I were talking about some of the challenges particularly if people are moving or shaking, uh, there are uh, problems with doing imaging. Um, but if we can uh, address that to look at how dopamine medications alter the striatal regions that are activated by reward and punishment learning. Um, and again, look at strange here, resting state connectivity measures like we've used in PTSD to look at interhemispheric connectivity in the striatum um, in both the Medicaid unmedicated patients and particularly in terms of on and off uh, stimulation. Great, so I think I'll just leave there. Thank you very much. Right, and also we're looking very much at an instrumental paradigm, looking at the feedback about the consequences of one's choice. I think a lot of the data that you're talking about, and Catherine may know this more than I, looks at Pavlovian. And so there's also been a dissociate, there's also been a suggested dissociation between the dorsal striatum and instrumental learning about the consequences of one's actions versus the ventral striatum and its link to the limbic system being more associated with prediction learning. Let me just ask Catherine, do you have any uh, insights into that that you want to? Uh, maybe just that a uh, slight more sophisticated way to, to think about how to link the analyst and the data might be that it's not only reward per se, but prediction of reward and violation of that expectancy. So if they miss reward, it's sort of like a punisher. Which so much sounds similar to this, sort of the instrumental issue. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's now a pretty substantial body of data that you may be familiar with. Uh, Nora Volko kind of simulated this. Uh, she's the head of. Uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah, no, I know. I know her. I know her. You know her, but I, no, yeah. not everybody would. Uh, of, uh, and, and she started to get into the idea of obesity being uh, food addiction. When you say laterality in the paradigm. Well, laterality in, in fMRI. In fMRI, uh-huh. 
uh -huh. but, uh, as well as uh, the O2 tunnel vortex and the insulator. But the question is, is or, or the instance, is that these two areas of research seem to be going on in parallel without any cross uh -huh. And it, it seems to I me that it would be a good uh, you know, place mm -hmm. to look and see if there are any similarities or mm -hmm. differences between them. Because now there's a huge body, Dana Small at, at Yale, which is the closest in 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 ob people who are obese. Obese and just in, in mm -hmm. general uh, uh -huh. eating disorders. Great. So it, it just seems to me that that's something to look at. Uh -huh. I don't know if she knows your work or. Well, I know Nora, so I mean no. Yeah, well, but uh -huh. Nora hasn't really pursued this as much as other people, uh -huh. like like Dana and uh -huh. Eric Stice out in Oregon and, and so forth, and and actually at the obesity center in particular. So at our R Rutgers obesity center. No, it's well, I do know that, I mean, just to bring it back to the impulse control disorders, that one of the impulse control disorders that are triggered by dopamine agonists um, is compulsive eating. And people gain a lot of weight. Any other questions? I didn't, know, I didn't know that. So deep brain stimulation causes, uh, can, can people can... Yeah. Well, uh-huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So similar, similar to what you might see on dopamine agonists. Interesting. Me, 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 I was say, it's easier to get the food to your mouth if you're not <laughs> losing it off the spoon. So. Okay. Yes? Just a question uh, on the earlier slide about uh, reinforcement learning. Uh -huh. There's like talk of like reinforcement learning and computationally, how does that translate into hierarchical reinforcement learning? Um, so it sounds like you've been listening to talks from Nathaniel Daw, is that, uh, um, who's a former student in my lab. Um, so, uh, so reinforcement learning is essentially the engineering or the mathematical description of what psychologists refer to as instrumental learning. You know, it's just basically um, what, what's key is that what, what's key is that reinforcement learning is just telling you, did you get it right or wrong? You know, it's not telling you what the right answer is. It just says if you did something, that was the right thing. If you didn't do something, um, so you're sort of learning. Reinforcement is sort of learning about the concept of your actions, which is basically what we're talking about. Hierarchical reinforcement learning is something else entirely different, and that has to do with learning um, sort of level, uh, l being reinforced at different levels of abstraction, of a hierarchic hierarchy, and it's sort of not really relevant here. I mean, it's a whole other area. I don't know the statistics, but you know maybe half the people. You know, so it's not that hard, or half more have depression. So it's not that everyone. Uh -huh. right. Well, we were just using stan you know, using standard clinical assessments, and so. Any other? Do you know which dopamine receptors are involved in these various pathways? I d I, d I don't know the different receptor pathways. Sorry. B1, B2, B3 receptors are right. involved and they change right. with the uh, onset of Parkinson's. They change in what way? They change up to up regulation uh -huh. and down regulation. So yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that line of the story, but I'd love to hear more about it sometime. In the obesity and addiction literature, I think both the B2 receptors have been looked at, which seems to be playing a lot of A lot of. In just obesity addiction, but what about in other addictions no, I, like I, cocaine I, or? I don't think there is such a thing as obesity addiction, but in, in the obesity literature, obese people tend to have decreased B2 receptor uh, binding in the dorsal striatum. Uh, in some of the addictive uh, addiction literature, uh, which I know almost not at all, I believe that B2 receptors are generally decreased in the dorsal striatum uh, in addicted individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all very much for your time.
Thank you guys for coming over. So what do you think of that take on the... <laughs> what?